The array class provides a large amount of flexibility. Why would you ever use any other data structure? Well, consider this. What if you need to store information on customers and you need instantaneous lookup based on the customer ID? What if database lookup is too slow, perhaps on a high traffic website, so you want an in-memory lookup mechanism? If the data doesn't change very often, you can use an in-memory data structure, but you still need some fast way to find the customer. Array would make this possible, but it's not optimal. It would be better to use some data structure which was indexed by that customer ID field, rather than by some numerical index, which is all an array could ever do. You could find the correct customer without searching, without looping through all the elements. Are there data structures that allow more abstract storage of data in ways that are different than just an array, a list of data? Not just a list of values? Are there data structures that allow you to index the values by some key that can be of any type? And obviously we wouldn't be asking the questions if there weren't answers, and the answer is in the system.collections.generic namespace. I do want to mention that you don't need to use these. You can use non-generic versions of these collections we'll be talking about. Generics just make it easier. Prior framework versions included classes with much of the same functionality, without generics type safety. The array list, stack, queue, collection-based classes, and more provided these data structures, but they allowed you to add any type. For example, if you had an array list, you could put anything in there. And I suppose that could be construed as a good thing, but it also means when you attempted to retrieve the data, you never really knew what was in an array list. This increased the complexity of consumer code because you had to check to make sure you had the right thing in the list of objects. These won't be covered here. They're included in the framework only for legacy's sake. Instead, we'll focus on newer, generic versions of these data structures. And when I use generic, I don't mean more generalized. What I mean is specific versions which are built to handle generics. So we'll need to think about these collections in terms of how they're built. What is a collection class? A collection class is a class that contains a collection of other types. An array is a primitive collection class. It's a fixed sized list of values or references. The collection classes in system.collections.generic namespace provide much more. They make it easy to add, find, and manipulate elements of the collection. Now each of these classes we're going to talk about implements one or more interfaces provided by this namespace. These interfaces define the minimum accepted behavior of the classes. For example, if you want to be able to use a for each loop to iterate through the elements of a collection, that collection has to implement the I enumerable interface. So let's stop and look at each of these interfaces we'll need to know about. The I enumerable interface requires that any class that implements it provide an enumerator. You can enumerate through all I enumerable classes using a for each loop. That's what you get if your class implements I enumerable. The array implements the non-generic version of I enumerable. That's why you can use a for each loop with an array. All collections covered here implement the generic version of I enumerable. There's only one method required, the get enumerator method, so that the for each loop can perform its work. So every class we'll look at implements this interface. The I collection interface implements and extends I enumerable. It adds support for manipulating a collection of items. Just because something implements I enumerable doesn't mean it works as a collection. It's just something you can iterate through. Something that implements I collection is enumerable and supports manipulating a collection of items. This interface requires a class to have add, clear, contains, copy to, and remove methods. And you can imagine how those work with a collection. Add an item, clear all items, 
check to see whether an item is in the collection, copy the collection to an array, and remove item from the collection. Everything that implements iCollection will have those methods. All these are things you need to do with collections. The iList interface implements both iEnumerable and iCollection. So any class that implements iList must also implement those other interfaces. This adds an item property, so you can retrieve any specific item in the collection. Index of, so you can tell where an item is. Insert, so you can insert an item at any location within the collection. And remove at, so you can remove an item at a specific location. The iList interface provides support for lists of values and objects. This is the interface we'll make the most use of because the list class implements this interface. There's one more we need to care about, that's iDictionary. This implements both iEnumerable and iCollection, but it adds support for storing key value pairs. It uses a unique key to store and locate a value. This is the kind of collection you would have to have to answer the question, how do I find a customer by the customer's unique key without having to look through every item in the collection? A dictionary would make that possible. A dictionary requires keys and values properties, so you can get a collection of all the keys and a collection of all the values, along with add, contains key, so you can tell if a key is in the collection or not, remove to remove an item, and try get value, which allows you to attempt to get a value, and if the key you're looking for isn't in the collection, you don't raise an exception, you just return false. We'll look at all of these later in this chapter. So why should you even think about interfaces? Several features in .NET accept values for parameters and behavior based on implementing a particular interface. For example, in a Windows application, imagine you want to bind data to a list box controls data source property. This requires something that implements the iList interface, either generic or not generic, or the iList source interface, which we won't talk about here. That's a Windows Forms thing. Either way, if your object implements iList, we'll stop there, then you'll be able to display the contents of your list within the list box without writing any code. You'll just need to set the data source property equal to your object, and magic will happen. Once you determine that a property or parameter requires an object that implements a particular interface, all you need to do is find types that satisfy this requirement or create your own. If I look at the documentation for the array class, I see that it implements the iList, iCollection, and iEnumerable interfaces. If I go look at the documentation for the system.collections.generic.list class, we'll see that it down here, implements iList, iCollection, and iEnumerable, the generic versions, and iList, iCollection, iEnumerable, the non-generic versions. It's nice they handle both of those things. Finally, if I go to, say, system.windows.forms.listbox class here, and we look at members exposed by the list box type, we can come down here and find the data source property. There it is. Now it gets this from the list control base type, but it works the same whether it's a list box or a combo box. Down here, under property value, it says this is an object that implements the iList or iList source interfaces. So anything that implements one of those interfaces, you could set as the data source property of this list box. One last example, that is, oh, let's pick system collections.generic.list.sort method. Oh, I'll get to it this way. Let's go find its sort method, which is here. And you'll see here that we have, if we call the list sort method, here we have a generic I comparer. What does that mean? That means that something that implements the iComparer interface would be acceptable as this parameter. There's lots of places in .NET where parameters have to be of a particular interface type. This is just one of them. So knowing that 
objects implement specific interfaces can help you use methods and objects in the .NET framework. Let's start by looking at the generic list class. Arrays provide flexible storage for multiple items in a structured format, but they're not perfect. Arrays are fixed size, and inserting new items is difficult. The system.collections.generic.list class takes care of these issues. It implements iList, so it has all of the things that a list needs in order to work. It provides a wrapper around an internal and generally hidden from you array. It handles resizing and inserting items for you. This is the updated version of the non-generic ArrayList class. So if you're used to using the ArrayList class from a previous version of .NET, this is the updated version. Since this provides a wrapper for an internal array, that array is still fixed size. You can specify a starting size for that internal array, or you can let the list class handle it for you. As you add items, if the array fills up, the list doubles the size of the internal array. The count property returns the number of elements you've placed into that internal array. The capacity property returns the actual size of the array. And in general, those two values won't be the same. Now there's lots of things you can do with a list. We'll use an ordering comparer, and we'll see what that is, to provide support for both binary search and sort methods. If the type stored in the list implements the generic or non-generic I comparable, the list uses that object's compare to method to sort. If not, you have to supply an instance of an I comparer class or some comparing procedure that matches the delegate type required by sort in order to perform the sort. Now you've probably seen examples of these already. We'll be looking at them in this chapter in terms of generics. The list uses an equality comparer, and you probably have never seen this one before, to support the contains, index of, last index of, and remove methods. For simple values, it's easy to determine if one item equals another, right? If you have a list of strings, it's pretty clear if one string is the same as another. For complex values, it's not so easy. If you have a customer, how is the code supposed to know if one customer is the same as another? It can't just know to look at the customer ID value. You have to tell it. To make this possible, the class in the list must implement the iEquatable interface, which supplies an equals method so that you can tell if one object equals another one. This allows the .NET runtime to compare two instances and determine if they're the same. Imagine the scenario. You want to remove an item from a list. You supply the item you want to remove, say a customer. How is the list supposed to know which customer in the list is the same as the one you're trying to remove unless it has some way to compare two customers? And it does that using the iEquatable interface. The list is the most common generic collection class. It turns up all over the framework, and it's the easiest one for you to use. The course covers much of the class's functionality, like 97%. More than for other collection classes. We really won't spend this much time on the others, because first of all, most of the others copy behavior from list, and second, because list is the one you're most likely to use. So let's start by looking at methods of the list class for adding and removing items. There's a count property, obviously, so you can tell how many items are in the list. There's a capacity property, so you can tell how big the internal array is. You generally don't need to care. There's an add and an add range method. Add allows you to add one item. Add range allows you to add a group of items stored in an array. So you can fill the list all at once by going foomp, and sending over an entire array full of data. There's insert, which allows you to insert at a particular location. Add always adds at the end. And insert range, which allows you to insert a range at a location. The clear method removes everything. Trim excess, that's interesting. 
trim excess says if the count is 5 and the capacity is 32, I will trim the size of the array so it is just big enough to hold 5. This is a good memory saving tool if you have a large list. Remove at and remove range allow you to remove elements. And the remove method, this is the tricky one, allows you to find a particular element and remove it. I need to say a few more words about the remove method before we look at the demonstration. The remove method performs a linear search. It uses the equals implementation of the I equatable interface so it can find a matching item to remove. This type of activity is called ON, and we'll see this syntax a lot. That means that the length of time to perform the search is on the same order as the number of elements. If you double the number of elements, you, on average, double the length of time the search requires. Binary search is faster. O log n is the order of that search. That's log base 2 for you math folks out there. Doubling the size only increases the search time a little because binary search divides the list in half over and over again until it zeroes in on the item it's looking for. Cutting it in half always makes the size smaller and smaller and smaller so it can find the item quicker. A perfect operation would be O1, that is constant. I mean, actually, we actually will find some behavior that is nearly O1, so that even if you double, triple, ten times the size of the list, the behavior doesn't take any longer. Remove method, however, is not one of those. It gets slower the more items you add to the list. Well, it's time to look at some behavior of the list class. Let's do a demo now and demonstrate how you can work with the generic list class. Let's start by investigating ways to add items to a list. I'll choose item A to get started. This example starts by creating a new directory info object pointing at C colon backslash windows so I can look at all the files in my windows folder. It also is going to create a new generic list of file info objects. Remember what that means. It means that we have a list that can only contain file info objects. If you attempt to add something else, it will fail. For each file as file info, in the results of calling the get files method of my directory info object, I want to add each item to my list. Now, beware, you wouldn't normally do this. If you have the data in an organized structure, in this case it's an array, you can easily just add the entire array into the list. But that wouldn't let me show off what I was trying to show here. And that is, as you add items, what happens to the capacity property of the list? Let's just let this run full speed and then go look at the results. Here, we see that we start out with a capacity of four, one file, capacity of four. When we get to five files, we have to increase the capacity, and it doubles. You get to nine files, it doubles again to 16. That's the way it goes. I could, however, trim the size, as you'll see in the next demonstration. Let's try option B, which shows other methods for adding and removing items from a list. Here, we'll show off how you can work with the list adding and removing at various times. We'll start by, for demonstration purposes, creating an array of writers. Let me insert five writers. There's the constructor for the writer class. I'll step over it from now on. We now have five writers in our writers collection. Notice this line of code allows us to pass in an array of writers. Actually, you can pass in anything that implements I enumerable. That's a lot of things. So if I run this code, I end up now with a list of writers already filled in. But what happened to the size of the list? Well, let's look. I have some support routines we'll be using throughout the chapter, so let's step in and see what those look like. Display list and capacity has several overloaded versions, one of which allows you to determine whether you want a carriage return before the list or not. I call it the overload that assumes you do. Here, I know that I want a carriage return line feed before it, so I will go display my list. Display list is a procedure which first displays a prompt, and display prompt says if you want that carriage return, now's the time to display it, and it does. And it displays a prompt, and you can see the prompt there. 
Okay, so now we're going to loop through for each item as object in the list. So every time we call display list, we'll get a numbered list. So we'll step through this and display each item one at a time. I'll do it real fast. There we go. And we'll write out at the end of this, because display list and capacity does this, we'll display the count and the capacity. Okay. So what do we get? Count is 5. Capacity is 5. So it looks like when you fill the list in its constructor, they set the capacity to be exactly the right size. Let's try another thing. Let's clear the list. Okay. Now let's add a range of my writers. This is we're adding it after the constructor. At this point, add the writers back again. They don't modify the capacity. It's still 5. It doesn't like do some magic, oh, should be 4, so we'll double it to 8. None of that stuff. 5 is fine. They leave it at 5. OK. So let's insert a new writer at this point. So here, when we insert the new writer at position 0, that's the insert method lets you do, we display the list now. Well, since they couldn't fit it in 5, they doubled it to 10. And of course, if we fill it to 10, they'll double it to 20, and so on. Now I'm going to clear the list again. And it's important to note that the clear method doesn't reset the capacity. Back here, when we cleared the list and the capacity was 5, it didn't change that capacity. It was still 5. But our list only contained 5 writers, so it fit fine in that space. We clear the list, and we'll add a new writer. And add always adds it at the end of the list. If the count is currently 0, it adds the new writer, so the count becomes 1. And they assert it at the beginning of the list, at the beginning of the internal array. So we add the new writer, Doug and Melanie. And now we have Doug at position 0, Melanie at position 1. We're going to insert a range at position 1, which means it will go between Doug and Melanie. And we'll end up with now our list. There are seven items. Doug at the beginning, Melanie at the end, plus our five original items. The count is seven, but the capacity didn't double yet because we haven't filled the array. Let's remove the item at position zero. That's what remove at does for us. If we display the list now, you'll see that we just have removed Doug. The capacity is still 10, even though the count has gone down by one. Remove another one at item zero, and you'll see that We've now removed Andy. Try doing that in an array. It's very hard. In a generic list, though, it's really easy to remove at any location within the array. Let's make the capacity equal to the count by calling the trim excess method. Trim excess reduces capacity till it matches, till it matches the count. And there it is. They're both 5 now. Now I can remove a certain number of items at a location. At location 1, I want to remove two items. That's going to remove Ken and Robert. Let's go try it. Ken and Robert are gone. Now we're going to call the remove method. And this is trickier, because the remove method allows us to pass the writer we want to remove. But how does it match that writer against what it finds in the collection? The answer is the writer class implements I equatable. And by implementing I equatable, we have to have an equals procedure. Now it's funny, because the base object class provides an equals procedure, as does this. They suggest that you don't name your method equals, but instead their code, when they spit it in for you, gets named equals 1. You could rename it back to equals, but it, it gives you a little blue squiggle complaining about it. Just leave it equals 1. You're never going to call it directly. You're just going to use it as part of comparing two writers. The name doesn't really matter as long as it implements the equals method of the interface. And it does. And it returns true if the current class's name equals the other instance's name. And also, I'm using the and also operator here just for a tiny optimization. Because if those two weren't equal, there's no point looking at the other. But if they are equal, also look at the other one and see if they're equal to compare home state to see if it equals the other instance's home state. If both properties are equal, we return true, otherwise return false. 
That's how we can compare to determine which item in the list of writers is Melanie. So we'll come along, and here's the constructor for the new instance of Melanie to compare to. And if we find it, we'll display it. So the remove method returns true if it succeeds and false if it doesn't. So we'll display here that we have successfully removed Melanie from that list. Okay, so we've looked at a number of different ways to insert, add, and remove items from the list. There are several methods you can use to return the list or information from the list. For example, the asReadOnly method returns a read-only wrapper around the list. This returns back to you a system.collections.objectmodel.readOnlyCollection instance, but you can also refer to it just as an iList. For the most part, that'll get you what you want. Now, the read-only collection doesn't allow you to add or remove objects, but it does allow you to modify properties of those objects. So it's not like it's read-only, you can't touch it but you just can't add or remove objects from the list. Now, if your list contains simple types like strings or numbers, you won't be able to change their values. For reference types, you just can't change what you're pointing to, but you can change properties of those objects. The toArray method copies the elements of the list into an array. This can be useful if you want to operate on the list using a method that doesn't understand about generics or requires an array. For example, the string.join method requires an array of strings. So you couldn't use a list of strings in that case. You'd have to copy it to an array first. The copy to method copies the entire list or a portion of the list to an array. The same issues apply as with the toArray method. The getRange method creates a shallow copy of a range of elements in the list, returning a new list for you. So you can use this to copy the top-level elements in the list to a new list. Now, if the objects in your list point to other objects, it doesn't make copies of those. It just copies the top-level objects to a new list. The sort method allows you to use the default iComparable interface to sort items in the list. If you want non-default order, the same issues apply as when you're working with an array. You have to provide an iComparer class to perform the sort. The reverse method reverses the order of the contents of the list. That's it. Let's try an example that shows off some of these methods. I'll choose option C to demonstrate returning the list. Here in the code, we'll start by filling a list of writers. In each case, we create a new writer instance, passing information to the constructor, and add that new writer to the list. I'm stepping over the lines of code. Now, I've declared RO writers as I list of writer. I could have declared it as system.collections.objectmodel.readonlycollection of writer, but since I'm only going to be doing very simple things with it, I can treat it as an I list, which provides very simple methods for working with a list. And that's how I've done it here. I've declared it as I list of writer. And I'll call myWriters.asReadOnly to return a read-only wrapper around my list. This would allow you to return a read-only version of your list to a consumer from code you've written. Maybe there's a developer who you're working with or some other group of developers who you want to be able to see what's in your list, but not to be able to add or remove items from your list. OK. As a matter of fact, you can't even try to add or remove items, because this type, the read-only collection or the iList type, doesn't have any methods to let you do it. So you can, however, modify properties of objects in the read-only collection. Here, I'll modify the name of writer0. And we can display that now, if we look at the writers, the read-only writers and the original writers the name is changed in both. I only changed it in the RO writers collection, but since that's a wrapper around the original writers list, well, it changed in both places. Because there's only really one place, right? OK, let's call the toArray method. This now copies it into an array. And although I can't really demonstrate that here, except by looking at it and seeing that it is an array full of five writers, 
and the declaration indicates that it's now an array, and if I display it, you'll see that array in my console window. Okay, what else can you do? We can try the copy to method. Let me make an array with room for two items, numbers 0 and 1. I'll call the copy to method starting at the second item, well, it's not the second, it's item number 2, 0, 1, 2. I'll copy the new writers. I'll say here, start at the 0th position in the output and copy two writers. So here we go. Now we should see in our output that we have taken two writers starting at position 2 from the original list and put them at position 0 and 1 in the output array. We can also call the getRange method. It returns back a list of the same type as the original list. It just gives us a subset of that list. This says start at position 2, take two items, copy them to the new list, and we'll display our new list. And there we are. Finally, let's call the sort and reverse methods. Now remember, the sort method can only work without parameters if the class that's in your list implements iComparable. Let's check. Writer implements iComparable. So we can sort writers. Remember that if you implement iComparable, you have to have a compareTo method which compares something about the current instance to something about an other instance. Here we're comparing the name property of both writers in order to sort them. Okay, let's sort, reverse, and then display the results. There we go. We sorted alphabetically on name, reversed the list, and display it here in opposite sorted order.